Good morning, everybody. Today, we are going to take a ride into the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And we're going to look at Aegean art. This is all Bronze Age cultures. And even though Crete is in the middle of the Mediterranean, it lumps into Aegean art because it's connected with the Cyclades and up to the Aegean Sea. So we call it all Aegean art. And so we're gonna look at the Cycladic period, which goes from 3000 to 1600 BCE, then the Minoan period, which is centered around Crete from 2200 to 1400. And then lastly, in the second lecture, we'll take a look at the Mycenaeans, who are the Greeks before the Greeks, if you will. So I've made an outline for you, just because when we're looking at things that are this old, that we have this little information for, it's easy to get confused about where they're from and how they go together. So in the Aegean world, basically we have a date debate, and I'll talk about that. We look at the Cycladic Islands from the Bronze Age, and really all we have from the Cycladic Islands are these little sculptures. And then in the Minoan civilization, it's mostly centered around Crete. We also have the island of Thera and one or two islands that are sort of outliers. And we have quite a bit of art from there. When we move to mainland Greece, we'll look at the Mycenaean civilization who really are the pioneers of Aegean archeology. span And with the Mycenaeans, we begin to see stonework architecture that starts to sow seeds for Western architecture. We do have some architecture on Crete as well. We have the palace complex of Knossos, but it's really an anomaly in many ways. So, this is really an ongoing study of grave sites, fortresses, architectural complexes, tombs, and they're still discovering things today. It's very, very old, and it, the use of bronze really started somewhere between 3000 and 1000 BCE. So we've got a 2000 year spread, which in and of itself is rather interesting. Most of these people were, of course, seafarers. It's centered around the sea. They're also farmers. And of course, they would be traders because all of these islands are extremely rich in minerals and other sorts of items that aren't found on the mainland. So because of this, there was a central sociological influence from these people. The dates on most of the work we're gonna look at are extremely controversial because we can't read their writing. We use what's called relative dating, which means that somebody has to decide how old something is and then someone else has to decide if they're right and then decide if the first thing we're looking at is the correct date in relation to the second thing we're looking at. So I know that sounds like a lot of gobbledygook, but the point being is that there's a hot debate on how old many of these things really are because there's no definitive way to say. We can only say, well, this object we know might be this old, so if that's right, then this might be this old. Now, Evans discovered Knossos, and he set the first system in place, so it all kind of comes from him as the primary source. Finding records from the ancient Near East and Egypt gets us somewhat closer. So, for example, if we find an object that we can date or an object that's clearly Egyptian from a similar time period, for organic material, of course, they can use radiometric da data. And there was a volcano in Thera that erupted somewhere around 1630 BCE. So that's also another date that we can kind of use as a benchmark. Stockstad uses the dates compiled from these sources and she calls it a best guess. So first we're gonna look at the Cycladic art on the Cyclades Islands. They had a Neolithic culture and early Bronze Age as well. So agriculture and herding, crafts, trade. They had a lot of local stone, so they could build and make art from their local stone. So if you think back, for example, to the ancient Near East, we saw that mask of a woman from Warka, that was an imported stone. They didn't have local stone there. So here, the fact that sculptures would be made out of stone might not necessarily delineate status, as stone was easily obtainable. 
In 6000 BCE, they began using clay, and in 3000 BCE, they began to use ceramics. And of course, the difference between ceramics and clay is ceramics would be fired. So here's the Hellenic world. And you know, I love maps. So in the Cyclades, we're up here in these islands. Here's the Aegean Sea way up here. So you can see the Mediterranean Sea, and I've, I'm gonna zoom out a little in the next map, I think. But you see, Crete is down here. This is where Knossos is and the Minoans will be. And then the Mycenaeans are over here in Greece. So this area right here is the area that we're studying in this chapter. We zoom in here. So the Hellenic world is the world that's encompassed by ancient Greece and this inset, you can see the Mediterranean Sea. And again, I always like to stress the point of in the context of the entire map of the entire world, how small the areas that we're looking at actually are. So for this first part of the lecture, we're right here where it says Cycladic. See this funny looking statue over here? We're gonna be looking at these. Here's Thera down here in Akrotiri, and they go with Crete. This is sort of a topographical map, if you will. So both the Cycladic and Minoan were seafarers, and we have some evidence that they were trading. We found, for example, an Egyptian scarab in the island of Rhodes. So some of these are some of the, some of the examples of things that we found. And as you've seen in the map, the Cyclades are stepping stones between Asia Minor and Greece that people in the Middle and the Near East reached Europe by water from the Cyclades island. And then in Milos, they had a great stock of obsidian and in many of the other islands they had marble, gold, silver, and copper. So they were very prosperous these islanders. This is called a quote unquote frying pan, although the reason it's called frying pan is that the archeologist that discovered it thought it looked like a frying pan. Nobody knows what this thing is. What do you guys think this thing is? It's made out of terracotta, so a fired clay, and it's about 11 inches wide, so it's as wide as a piece of notebook paper. And it's got beautiful stylized designs carved on it. At the bottom, this could be some sort of a place for a handle. It could be any one of a number of uses that this thing could have been for. There's designs on both sides of it and there's a boat on a sea on the outside of it. So this object is 4,000 years old, this unknown beautiful object. There's many, many of these female figures found in and next to graves. And, and this is actually on your test. The distinguishing, one main distinguishing figure about these is they're the first large female figures that we've found. They range from a few inches to actually five feet long. So some of them are big. And we know that they used obsidian tools to make them. This one is one foot long, one foot seven inches long. So how long is that? Uh, 12 and 7, like 19 inches, so like as long as your arm, maybe. They're very haunting, aren't they? We do know that the Cyclades had a cult of the mother goddess, and as far as Bronze Age sculpture goes, these are some of the most beautiful artifacts that exist, and there are many, many of them. They're very simplified. This particular one's marble. Some of them are made of, of limestone, some are made of marble. They were all found in graves. Some people think they were companions of the deceased, but the thing that really strikes me about these is just the abstraction that we have such a sense of beauty and calmness in this. The stylization, they're stylized, but there's some differences. If you think about Egyptian art and the fact of how very canonized their art form was, this is, yes, it's got folded arms over as a mummy would have, and they're female, they, but they're different sizes. The poses are the same, but the figures look different. Very, very minimal anatomical detail. There are traces of paint, so we know they originally had painted faces. And again, they're the oldest large-scale female nudes known in Western art. They, we don't really see any more 
large female nudes until Praxiteles in the fourth century BCE when we start seeing figures of Aphrodite. I think it's interesting to compare this Cycladic sculpture from Egyptian sculpture from the same time period. So the dating on this Cycladic woman that's been given us is 2500 to 2200 BCE. And at the same time, this is when the Egyptians at the time of Khafra um, and Giza, actually this is the fourth dynasty. So we had Menkaura and his queen and the, they were contemporaneous here. Now, Interestingly enough, some of the proportions are similar, although the expressions on Menkaura and the Queen, they're very detailed. There's human expression of dignity, of it's definitely a political type of a, of a sculpture. The woman is secondary to the king. The female, in terms of the grave figure, is in repose. But it's interesting to note just the difference in the way these figures are portrayed. Now, these nude female figures weren't the only things that they found in the Cyclades. There's also these little instrumentalists, and some were found in and out around Grays, but also in other places. But there's many, many of them. I just have this flute player, and I think I have a lyre player too. And they're just haunting, isn't it? You, you look at this, he's playing sort of this double-sided flute. It's ma made out of some sort of wood. Um, and if you notice the movement, you can see the arms and the pipe as he's lifting this pipe up and lifting his head back. You can see his nose tilted up. And again, these most of these musicians are looking upwards, which I find interesting. Some books call them idols. Given the interpretation they were used for worship in the home and buried with their owners, no one really knows. This particular figure is sometimes given the name of Orpheus because he's playing a lyre. And you notice the joints and the breaks in it. They were found broken up. Some people think maybe that they were broken up by their owners and then buried. So maybe it's a bard singing a story. And so if you went with that theory, perhaps the larger statues would have been set up as votive figures. Again, no one really knows. That's really all we have from the Cyclades. But now we're going to take a look at Crete and the Minoan civilization. And the word Minoan comes from the legend of Minos and the Minotaur. And the legend of Minos and the Minotaur is the story of Theseus. I've given you a second PowerPoint with the story of Theseus on it. Crete, and you remember it from the map, is the largest island of all of the islands that we're looking at today. It's 150 miles along, so it's pretty long. And they grew grain, olives, a great deal of cattle, sheep. They had to trade for metal to make the bronze. They didn't have a very rich metal source on their particular island, but they were very wealthy, a wealthy power. They traded with Greece, they traded with Egypt, the Near East, Anatolia. Then king, the kings in Crete were very powerful. They had three goddesses. They found female images in grace and shrine, maybe goddesses, maybe priestesses, maybe worshipers. We do have a written record from them, but no one's been able to translate it yet. We do have some later records that give us some idea of their material culture. So we have information, but we don't know how to interpret it, basically, is what I'm telling you. Here is the octopus flask, and this is dated 1500 to 1450 BCE. And it's a good way to think about the lifestyle and the outlook of the Minoan culture, because you can see this octopus. And here's a thing about the octopus. Octopi can regrow their tentacles if you lose a tentacle. They're also full of energy. So it's a complete design. It's encompassing the entire vase. It's moving. It's curvilinear, beautiful little sea creatures and vegetation decorating around the octopus. Plus, it's very expressive. So if you think of some of the design we saw from ancient Egypt, rather more patriarchal, you can see there's a great contest here. And there's a 
school of art history that equates curvilinear designs with being viewed as being more feminine, rectilinear designs as more masculine. I leave it to you to decide whether you agree with that. That would be an interesting topic for a thesis to postulate for or against. This is a reconstruction view of the palace complex at Canossos. So from the ruins that have been discovered, archaeologists can extrapolate that this is what it would have looked like. And so there were actually three periods to this construction of this. It began in what they called the Old Palace period that began around 1900. This is a place where there's a great deal of earthquake, fire. They had a second palace period in 1700, and then finally it was destroyed in 1375. So all that's left of it is ruins. We call these architectural complexes palaces. We really don't know for sure if the king lived here, although there is a throne room. Actually, it's called the Queen's Megaron. We think it was a queen there, not a king, or a priestess. We don't know the function of this entire complex. It was made completely out of dress stone and then wooden columns. You can sort of see all these wooden columns here holding everything up. So. It was the result of many, many different building phases. It wasn't all realized at once. So it wasn't like a complete architectural design of the sort that you saw, for example, at Saqqara or the pylon temples that were realized as a particular plan and then built. Although even Luxor had been added onto over the centuries. This complex was really added onto as needed. So as more people came to live there, or as they needed more storage rooms, or if they needed more spaces for different things, they would just add them all, almost kind of hodgepodge. And so they made stories all from tailored, tapered columns. They had light wells, they had skylights, so there would be a great deal of sunlight and fresh air. And it was made out of wood and mud brick. And a lot of that is because, for one thing, that's what they had, but also wood is more flexible during earthquakes. So the main concern really was, was quote unquote, here and now, they had administrative buildings, residences, ritual areas, ev everything all together. Here's an aerial plan of the architectural ruin that was found. So you can see the central courtyard in here and then all of the, so the labyrinthine complex of buildings around it, which is part of how it got its name. The legend of the Minotaur was around long before the discovery of the palace at Canossos. So this is not fortified. We don't see any central ring walls or anything around it because the island itself is the fortification. And another thing that's interesting about this is that the tops of the columns are wider than the bottom and they're, they're wooden columns. You wouldn't really do that with stone columns. This is what's called the throne room. All of the inside of the palace is brightly, brightly painted with fresco. And in fresco, if you remember, they take plaster. We saw this in Egyptian art. Pigments are mixed into the plaster and then it's all applied. Or the plaster can be wet and then pigments are applied to the wet fat plaster. So two different ways. In the Minoan culture, they use the water-based pigments and the wet plaster. And if you note, again, this is all curvilinear forms, more evidence to support a matriarchal culture here. Here's another view of this throne room, and you can see there's two griffins on either side of the throne. It's a symbol of divine power. So again, griffins are usually female. They lay eggs that are sapphires. They always accompany mother goddesses. And you can see the wooden columns here. So there was a wide doorway leading from the antechamber into the throne room. And we can see scuff marks on the floor. So we know that originally there was two double doors there. You can see from this angle, the throne's complete, almost completely embedded into the north wall. And then here is this sort of basin and where, you know, we don't really know what it was used for. And then if you go past where these two columns are, this is called lustral basin, which is a sunken room. Maybe they even filled that whole room with water. Again, we don't really know. We can only use our imagination to think about what it would have looked like inside this room when the people of the Minoan culture were gathered and who was sitting on this throne? What was in this basin? What were the people doing? Here's a fragment 
from the fresco. You can see part of this bird here, and he, you can see here where it's sort of worn off. It shows you this painted plaster and the wall underneath, and just the beautiful attention to detail and every little plant and all of the decoration in it. Now this is a copy. This is from what's called the Hall of the Frescoes, which is a room in the palace that's full of many, many different frescoes. This was just called Ladies in Blue. Again, we don't know much about these ladies, but think back to those last Egyptian paintings we saw from the tomb of Nibamun. Very similar in attitude and in drawing, I find. And also, if you look at Indian art, you see this kind of look as well. And note, we've got this profile view with the, with the frontal eye on the side of the face. I find that very interesting. This is a copy. So if you go there, they have made copies of many of these frescoes and put them into these frames. So that's what you're looking at. Here's a room that's been restored on the basis of the plan of the ground floor walls. So again, this is part of the museum. If you go and look, notice the tapering of the column from bottom to top. This column is in its original color. Sir Arthur Evans, when he came, he repainted a lot of the columns and he rebuilt a lot of the palace practices that wouldn't have been done today, but this is original. So they found lots of frescoes in the in the palace complex and they've put them all in the Heraklion Museum. And so there's two groups of them, decorative with geometry and then also scenes from daily life. This is inside a room called the Queen's Megaron and a Megaron is an audience room. And you can see that there are dolphins just beautifully, they're leaping, they're graceful. You notice the geometric decoration, the, there's flowers and spirals. In classical mythology, dolphins are, go with the goddess of love and beauty, Aphrodite. So some people say that the roots of Aphrodite are here in Knossos. Here's a detail of the leaping fish. Okay, so hopefully you've read the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur because this image is very much an illustration to the point of what that myth might have stemmed from. They had this practice in Gnossos of what they called bull leaping. And this painting, it's got areas of modern reconstruction in it. It's from the period from 1450 to 1375 BCE. So roughly a thousand years before the high culture of ancient Greece. Now, subjects on the walls include many sports activities and both men and women participated in this. And in this one, it's a game of bull leaping where participants vault over the top of the bull. Some people say that the figure of the woman on the right is getting ready to catch the man jumping over. Others say they move from left to right, grab the bull by the horns, and then vault over the back. You know, I leave it to you. The bull is moving one way. Would you be going toward the bull and then using that energy to go backwards or would you be going forward into his path? You know, I'm not sure. It seems to me more logical the other way, but not being a bull leaper, I don't know, but it's fun to think about it. Now, in Akrotiri, there's a great deal of wall painting as well. It's got a little bit different character, much more naturalistic, much more vivid and bright, reflective of the colors of the sea and the landscape around the sea. It's just a pure landscape, hills, rocks, and flowers, and sailors that know this part of the, of the world know that these colors are very true to the way that the colors actually look. So it's a really good example of how color in the environment affects art. They covered the walls of their palace rooms with fresco, and they used both the dry fresco, fresco secco, and the wet on wet. They used mostly red, yellow, black, white, green, and blue. This is a beautiful image of a young girl gathering crocus flowers, and it's again, it's from the second palace period. This is probably one of my favorite pictures, this picture of boxing children, again, from Akrotiri. It's large scale, and notice again, it's retaining this Egyptian tradition of the frontal eye in a profile face. But I love the action of this. We see how the two children are engaged, one with each other, and we see the importance of these athletics, of this learning boxing, of the boxing contest. Here's some ceramics. This is a Camaris Ware jug from Faistos. And again, the structures are focusing on landscape features. So this is from a little bit earlier than that octopus vase that we saw. 
we had large, large centralized complexes, large centralized workshops with large scale manufacturing on several of the islands. This is actually discovered in a cave named Camaris. It was overlooking this complex where it was discovered. A lot of the income for the Minoans came from this large and thriving ceramics industry. Very, very thin walls, very beautiful use of color, decorated by forms from plant life, and they were exported to Egypt, to Syria. We found them throughout the Mediterranean, these jugs. This particular pendant was found near Malia in Crete. Again, it's from the old palace period. And these techniques are borrowed from the ancient Near East. Very, very simplified geometric forms. Now the Minoan jewelers decorated their gold work with these tiny little balls, all fused to the surfaces. This, this technique did come from Syria. So we know that there was contact between Minoan artists and Syrian artists. But again, nobody's been able to completely duplicate this technique today. Here's a view of the reconstruction done by Sir Arthur Evans, and your book talks about this. There's hundreds and hundreds of columns made out of wood. It covered six acres, and so this is where it got the name The Labyrinth. Now we know, and Stockstad does talk about this, today's archaeologists would never do such a thing. They'd never go in and change and add columns and paint what color they thought it would look like they would restore. So here is the restore west portico and the fresco behind it is reconstructed but you know the thing that Evans did do was give us a really good flavor of what this palace must have been like in its glory just imagine this entirely brightly brightly colored complex and the sight that it would have presented to someone visiting it for the first time you can see the fresco of the bull behind these columns again signifying the importance of the bull in this culture and speaking of the bull <laughs> here is a bull's head right on so a right on is meant for pouring liquid during sacred ceremonies and most of these have been found in pieces so we think that perhaps there was ritual breakage it's all made out of a rock called steatite and then it's got mother of pearl on it shell jasper rock crystal gold horns and red jasper they the horns are actually restored they would have been solid gold very very high degree of realism here this is probably one of the best known artifacts found at Knossos. This is called the Woman with Snakes, and her date is between 1600 and 1500 BCE. She's made out of, a, of fans, which I'll explain to you what that is. And it's a reflection of Minoan weaver's preference for bright colors, which is a theme that we've seen throughout this lecture. These bright colors reflected from the sea, from the rocks, from the land, from the ve vegetation on these ocean mountains. Very, very realistic modeling, but it's very stylized as well. And it really shows this love of energy and movement. Exposed breasts, pretty likely it has to do with fertility. And snakes are associated with earth cults. They exist very close to the ground and they shed their skin. So it's in the theme with the octopus as well, which is also a regenerative animal. You notice that there's a cat on her head, which is often associated with feminine power and or with royalty. This tells you about faience. Faience is actually what's called a tin glazed earthenware. And it's actually lead glaze and it's made white and opaque. So they make the clay, they fire in a kiln, then they dip it into the tin glaze, which makes it very, very white. Then they can paint designs onto the glaze, which makes them very, very bright. They fire it again. So that's part of how these Minoans were able to get such a brightly colored effect on this sculpture. And it attests to the high degree of advancement in their technology that they had this several step process in their artwork.